dealing with the history of the English Bible. We want to look at three of the great Bibles and three of the important centuries in that history, beginning with the John Wycliffe and the Wycliffe Bible of the 15th century. It was actually completed in about 1380, but it had a great influence in the next century, in the 15th century. And then the Tyndale Bible of the 16th century and the King James Bible of the 17th century and its influence, of course, has extended even until this very day. We will look at some of the other versions as well, such as the Geneva, but these are the three that we want to focus on. Now, John Wycliffe is the father of the English Bible. He lived from 1324 to 1384, and he gave the English-speaking people the first Bible in our language. It was translated from Latin, and uh, in Wycliffe's day, Rome ruled England and Europe with an iron fist. To illustrate the conditions of that day, uh, we can think of King John II of England and how he was treated by Pope Innocent III about a hundred years before the time of Wycliffe. The King of England had done things that displeased the Pope, so the Pope excommunicated him, and he issued a decree declaring that the people were no longer subject to their own king. Uh, the Pope ordered the King of France to organize an army in order to try to overthrow John. And the Pope also called for a crusade against John. He promised that anyone that would participate would be forgiven of their sins and would have a share in the spoils of war. And so King John of England submitted to the Pope. He pledged complete allegiance to him in all things. He gave England and Ireland into the Pope's hands. Here is the actual oath that John signed in May 15, 1213. I, John, by the grace of God, King of England and Lord of Ireland, in order to expiate my sins from my own free will and the advice of my barons, give to the Church of Rome, to Pope Innocent and his successors, the Kingdom of England and all other prerogatives of my crown. I will hereafter hold them as the Pope's vassal. I will be faithful to God, to the Church of Rome, to the Pope my master, and to his successors legitimately elected. In those days Rome ruled with an iron hand and it was forbidden for the Bible to be translated into the languages of the people. Rome allowed the Bible in Latin, but most people of that day did not speak Latin. One of Wycliffe's enemies, Knighton, a canon of Leicester, a Roman Catholic, he complained about the Bible being translated into English. He said to do that would be to lay the Bible open to the laity and to women. He said that would be like casting the gospel pearl under the feet of the swine. And that was the attitude of, of the typical Roman Catholic of that day and certainly of the Pope. Now John Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest. He began to preach against some of Rome's errors in his mid-thirties. And throughout his life, he grew in his understanding of the Bible and he increased in his protest against Rome. We don't know a lot about his doctrine. Many of his writings have been destroyed because of the persecutions, but we do know something. We do have some of his writings. He rejected the doctrine that tradition is equal in authority to the Bible. And that's Rome's foundational doctrine. Without that, there's no Roman Catholic Church because there is no Roman Catholic Church in the Bible. It stands upon traditions. He rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the wafer becomes literally the body and blood of Jesus. He rejected indulgences. He taught that the apostolic churches, the true churches, only had elders and deacons, not popes and archbishops and cardinals and, and such. And he believed, he wrote in his own words, that anything beyond the elders and deacons were introduced by Caesarean pride. He was very bold. Wycliffe was very bold against the Pope. He said, it's blasphemy to call any man the head of the church, save Christ alone. This are, these are a couple of his statements on the Pope. It is supposed, and with much probability, that the Roman pontiff is the great Antichrist. Hank Anacraft says it's foolish to call the Pope the Antichrist. Well, all of the old reformers and Baptists called him the Antichrist. 
It's Hank Hanegraaff that's wrong. Then, John Wycliffe said, How then shall any sinful wretch, who knows not whether he be damned or saved, constrain men to believe that he's the head of a holy church? What bold words. In an hour when you, you'll be burned for saying such words, he said, Antichrist puts many thousand lives in danger for his own wretched life. The Pope. Why? Is he not a fiend stained, foul with homicide, who though a priest fights in such a cause, he's talking about all the wars and violence that the Pope's caused, a fiend stained, foul with homicide. How bold. The Pope ruled England in that day, you see. These were very, very bold words. He taught that men have the right to have the Bible in their own languages. This is what he said. You say it is heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. The Catholics are saying that. You call me a heretic because I have translated the Bible into the common tongue of the people. Do you know whom you blaspheme? Did not the Holy Ghost give the Word of God at first in the mother tongue of the nations to whom it was addressed? That's enough. Why do you speak against the Holy Ghost? You say that the church of God is in danger from this book. How can that be? Is it not from the Bible only that we learn that God has set up such a society as a church? Is it not the Bible that gives the authority to the church? Is it not from the Bible that we learn who is the builder and sovereign of the church? What are the laws by which she is to be governed? The rights and privileges of our members without the Bible? What charter has the church to show for all these? It is you who place the church in jeopardy by hiding the divine warrant, the missive royal of her king for the authority she wields and the faith she enjoins. He said the Bible ought to be in the hands of every person. He taught that men not only have the right to have the Bible, but they have the right to interpret the Bible. He said, believers should ascertain for themselves what are the true matters of their faith by having the languages, the scriptures, in a language which all may understand. Oh, by the way, he believed that the Catholic practice of establishing universities and granting masterships and doctorates had been inherited from the heathen and are altogether as as much use to the church as the devil. I had to throw that in since we're in a university. <laughs> By the way, I don't ha I'm not a doctor. People call me that, and I don't always stand up in the middle of everything and say, whoop, I'm not, but I'm, I'm not. So I've never earned one, and those that have been offered to me, I, I didn't accept. So, But that's what John Wycliffe believed, very bold and strong for the Word of God as he saw it and as he grew in his understanding. There's even some evidence that toward the end of his life he rejected infant baptism. This is questionable, but there is some evidence. There's evidence from his own writings. He taught this. These are his words. Baptism doth not confer, but only signifies grace which was before given. Now that entirely destroys the doctrine of infant baptism. The Martyr's Mirror, which was first published in Dutch in 1660, stated that in 1370, John Wycliffe issued an article declaring to militate against infant baptism. The Catholic authorities charged John Wycliffe with denying infant baptism. And we could give quotes from Walden and others. And even if Wycliffe himself never rejected infant baptism, which is possible, it is certain that many of his followers, the Lollards of the 1400s, did reject infant baptism. There were several kinds of Lollards, and some of them were Baptists. John Wycliffe was very bold. John Wycliffe preached against the begging friars of his day that would go around begging uh, 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 for penances from people, the friars, the monks of the Roman Catholic Church, and they were very wicked. This is what John Wycliffe said about them. Friars draw children from Christ's religion into their private order by hypocrisy, lies, and stealing. And thus they are therefore cursed of God as the Pharisees were of Christ. Friars show not to the people their great sins firmly as God biddeth. 
and namely to mighty men of the world, but flatter them and nourish them in sin. Sounds like some fundamental Baptist preachers I know. Also, friars, my friends, most preachers are not this bold today. The vast majority. For without authority of God, they make new religions of errors of sinful men. How bold he was. He was called the morning star of the Reformation. Now there's an interesting connection that I wanted to mention in passing about between Wycliffe and the Waldenses. The Waldenses. Now the Waldenses were Bible-believing Christians who lived in the northern part of Italy and the uh, uh, eastern part of France up in the Alps and from there spread out and sent missionaries out across uh, Europe, most parts of Europe, and even to England. The Martyr's Mirror in uh, 1391 says that uh, in 1391, 443 Waldenses were persecuted in England, a whole large mass of them. And some of them told their inquisitors at the trials that they had been in England for 30 years. And so that goes back to the very middle of when John Wycliffe was in his 30s. And there's very uh, interestingly, or very possibly, a connection between him. These things did not happen, of course, in a vacuum. And it's more common that believers influence others, and that's the way the truth is passed along. The Anglican historian Joseph Milner noted the connection between the Waldensies and Wycliffe. Milner said, This connection between France and England during the whole reign of Edward III was so great that it is by no means improbable that Wycliffe himself first derived his impressions of religion from Raymond Lollard. Now the Lollards that came after Wycliffe very possibly got their name from this Waldensian preacher who was burned at the stake in Cologne in Germany later. And so it very possibly was a connection. The Catholics charged Wycliffe with being a Waldensian, as of course they did anyone that disagreed with them. And the uh, Joshua Thomas in his history of the Baptist in Wales made that possible connection. There were Baptists, ancient Baptists up in the hills there and up in Herefordshire, which is where Wycliffe came from. And uh, Joshua Thomas believed that Wycliffe received much of his light in the gospel from those separatist believers. And Frederick Nolan, in his book, The Inquiry into the Integrity of the Received Text, 1815, makes that connection. And I think it's interesting to think about that. But of course, John Wycliffe had great battles with the Roman Catholic Church, as we can imagine from the doctrine that he held. Wycliffe was first forced to appear before the Catholic bishops in the first half of 1377. 1377 to give an account to them for what he was preaching and, and talk, writing. And uh, the bishops that same year wrote to Gregory, the Pope Gregory XI. Here he is in his chair. Pope Gregory XI. And they told him what Wycliffe was doing. And put, the Pope issued five papal bulls, proclamations, against Wycliffe in that one year. Five of them. And from that point on, to the rest of his life, uh, 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 Wycliffe was hounded by the Catholics, and they made every attempt they could to get their hands on him. But God protected him. Wycliffe was never arrested. He was never put in prison. He was never burned at the stake. And there are some reasons for that, humanly speaking. There was a man who was his protector for many years, named John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. And he was the shield for Wycliffe for many years. He loved old Wycliffe, and he was a powerful man, and he protected him any time they would try to do something against him. Until the end of his life, he did that. And at the very end of his life, just a few years before, Wycliffe came to the conclusion that transubstantiation was a heresy, and that's when John withdrew his protection. But there were others that helped him. There were two queens that helped protect John Wycliffe. Queen Joan. She was the wife of Edward III. He was called the Black Prince because he wore black armor. And he was a warrior and a king. But his wife loved Wycliffe and loved Wycliffe's preaching and protected him. When John Wycliffe was called before the tribunal in 1378 
called to stand before the bishops and cardinals and give account, and they were getting ready to arrest him and charge him with heresy, Sir Richard Clifford came from the palace and uh, with a message from the queen. And the, in fact, at that point, she was the queen mother. Her son was ruling at that point, uh, Richard II, with a message from her saying, don't mess with Wycliffe. And they didn't at that point. Queen Anne was the wife of Richard II, who followed Edward III. And she also loved Wycliffe and followed in her mother's footsteps, as far or her mother-in-law's footsteps, in loving Wycliffe and what he preached. Now, she was the daughter to uh, uh, the Roman emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Charles IV, and was the sister of the king of Bohemia. She was brought to England as a teenager, just a teenage girl. But when she came to England, she brought with her some precious books, uh, which was the scriptures in German and Bohemian and Latin that she brought with her into England to become Richard II's uh, II's wife. And she loved Wycliffe's doctrine. In fact, she had copies of his books. Of course, they had to be handwritten copies of those made and then sent back into Bohemia. And there's an association there between revivals that were going on in Bohemia and what was happening in England with a believer sitting as queen on the throne in that day. This godly queen died in 1394, though, at age of 27. But she helped protect Wycliffe. And uh, there was one other thing that happened during Wycliffe's life that helped protect him humanly speaking, and that was a very interesting thing. The, after Gregory the Eleventh, the Pope, died, Gregory the Twelfth came up into power, sitting on the papal throne, but many of the cardinals were, di- uh, didn't like him, and they said, we're going to have another Pope, and so they elected Benedict the Thirteenth. And so there were what? Two Popes. And this Pope cursed this Pope, and this Pope cursed this Pope, and they did that for a long time. Eventually, there were three Popes, and they all were cursing one another. And they were so busy cursing one another, they didn't bother with Wycliffe. (laughs) And that's a fact of history. The end of John Wycliffe's life. In 1381, just three years before he died, he finally came to the conclusion that Rome's doctrine of transubstantiation was heresy, and he lost his protector, the Duke of Lancaster, because of that. Wycliffe, at that point, was expelled from his teaching position at Oxford, was forced to go back to his parish of Lutterworth, to the church where he preached. This is the Lutterworth Church, where he was the preacher, and he lived there for the last few years of his life. In May 1382, Wycliffe was called before yet another tribunal, he, uh, it was called the Blackfriars Synod because it was held in a monastery called Blackfriars in London. But John Wycliffe called it the Earthquake Council because when all the bishops and cardinals and all were seated there, all of a sudden this terrible earthquake shook the city of London and spires fell and stones fell out of castles and everything was shaking and, and Wycliffe called it the judgment of God. He said it's the Earthquake Council. That synod condemned Wycliffe. They charged him with ten heresies and sixteen errors and forbade his writings to be read. The king gave authority at that point to arrest anyone that believed his doctrines. John Wycliffe died in December 1384 at age about 60. There's one more incident I want to note about John Wycliffe's life, though, and that happened after he was dead. In fact, after he was dead almost 44 years. Rome hated Wycliffe. They hated him in his life and hated him in his death. Rome was never ever able to capture Wycliffe and burn him during his life, but they still hated him. And so about 44 years later, they dug up his bones. I don't know how much was left then, but whatever was left, they burned those bones and they threw the ashes into a little river named Swift, which swept down into eventually the Severn River in northern England. And that's how much Rome hated a man that would dare to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Don't let anyone tell you that Rome ever was a friend of the Bible. Now the Wycliffe Bible. Wycliffe Bible, there's a facsimile here that the school has. 
Uh, the Wycliffe Bible was never printed, of course, until much later. Facsimiles were printed, but it was never printed. It was always handwritten at great, uh, with, with great labor, of course, and distributed that way. And uh, it had a great influence, though, even in handwriting copies. The New Testament was finished in 1380, the Old Testament in 1382, only a couple years before he died. And it was revised extensively by a man named John Purvey, who had been taught and was an associate of Wycliffe. And Purvey was an interesting man in his own right. Uh, he was not as strong in some ways as Wycliffe. He was arrested at one point and apparently, so it said, recanted. But he repented of that and he eventually died for his faith. Now this is one thing that John Purvey understood. That the fear of God is required to properly translate the Bible. The fear of God. Here's what John Purvey said about Bible translation. A translator hath great need to study well the sense both before and after. There is interpretation and context. You have to understand the scriptures to, to translate them. And then also he hath need to live a clean life and be full devout in prayer. Now listen to this. And have not his wit occupied about worldly things. I don't know if there's a man alive today that's qualified to translate the Bible. We are so surrounded and so inundated by worldly things. There are pastors that are as crazy about sports as heathens are. See why I don't get invited many places? But it's a fact and our wits are occupied with worldly things. So much more than and many times, many godly men in the past. But it's required, he said. In 1421, Purvey was arrested a second time for his persistence in preaching the doctrines of John Wycliffe. And he died in prison. We read, in great straits or in great suffering for the faith that he preached. In Saltwood Castle... John Wycliffe's translation was translated from the Latin Vulgate. It was not taken from Greek and Hebrew, and it therefore contained mistakes and textual mistakes which are in the Latin Vulgate that Rome had. The most glaring one that I found is the omission of God in 1 Timothy 3.16. The word God is omitted there, and that is a textual error that came down uh, in the Latin even. And so, but it's much closer than the critical texts of today. The language of Wycliffe is very simple and forceful, and it laid the foundation, the language did, for the Bibles that were to follow. For example, here is a selection from John 11, from the Wycliffe Bible. Now remember, this is 700 years old. The disciples said to him, Master, now the Jews sought and for to stone thee, and goest thou thither? Jesus answered, Whether there be not twelve hours of the day, if any man wander in the night, he stumblish. For light is not in him. He saith these things, and after these things he saith to him, Lazarus our friend sleepeth, but I go to raise him from the sleep. Therefore his disciples said, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall be safe. Did you understand that? Probably every word of it. Stumblish, we don't use that, but... That's 700 years old. English has not changed as much as most languages have. That's 700 years old. Sure, there are many words that we don't understand in Wycliffe, but the language and the power of it and the simplicity of it and the forcefulness of it. In fact, many phrases that are still in our King James Bible that we use today can be traced all the way back to Wycliffe, such as, straight is the gate and narrow the way. Born again. That's Wycliffe's words. Worship the Father in spirit and truth. The spirit of adoption of sons. A living sacrifice. The deep things of God. The cup of blessing which we bless. What fellowship hath light with darkness, Wycliffe wrote. We make known to you the grace of God. Why did sepulchers, he knew who those were, revelation of the mystery, be it far from thee. Despise ye the church of God, the world and all that dwell therein is the Lord's. Who is this king of glory? Those were Wycliffe's words. 
and hundreds and hundreds of others that still remain in our English Bibles today. John Wycliffe, an old warrior for the faith, a bright light in his day. We have much to be thankful for to John Wycliffe. Now we come to the second Bible. The second Bible in the history of the English Bible that we want to deal with this morning. And this is the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale lived from 1494 to 1536. Very, very important man. William Tyndale. He was the first to translate the Bible into English from the Greek and the Hebrew. His was the first Bible that was printed in the English language. His is the most important name in the history of the English Bible and one of the most important names in the history of the English people, period. When Tyndale was born, England was still greatly bowed down by Rome as it was during the days of Wycliffe more than a hundred years before. Rome was the state religion of England. The citizens were largely given over to idolatry and honoring the mass as the wafer is God, and worshiping that little wafer. Catholic images and famous shrines of Mary were pilgrimage sites, and people would flock to these sites, such as Our Lady of Walsingham and St. Anne of Buxom, and people would flock there and, and, and worship these idols of Mary. The Catholic priests controlled the people's lives from cradle to grave. People were very immoral because their religious leaders were immoral. The Catholic priests kept prostitutes and brothels in London for themselves. And therefore the moral state of the people was degraded beyond conception almost. Ignorance and vice and immorality of the worst sort reigned almost universally in England when William Tyndale was born in the early 1500s. There were laws that forbade the printing or the translation of the, uh, of the scriptures into English. Heretics had been burned at the stake since 1401, and those were the times in which Tyndale was born. In Tyndale's day, the popes of Rome were very powerful and very wicked. Sixtus IV, who lived or reigned from 1471 to 1484, established houses of prostitution in Rome. Innocent VIII, who reigned from 1484 to 1492, had seven illegitimate children by whom he and, and, and he enriched those children from the treasuries of the Catholic Church and made them rich. Alexander VI, who reigned from 1492 to 1503, he lived with a Spanish lady and her daughter. He had all kinds of children. He had five children. His favorite son, Caesar Borgia, very infamous name in church history, murdered his brother and murdered his own brother-in-law. They had orgies in the palace in, in Rome that were beyond uh, description. Just a few years before Tyndale was born, work was begun on the St. Peter's Basilica and parts of the 1,000-room Vatican Palace under the reign of Pope Nicholas V. Tyndale was also born into a time of great change. When he was eight years old, Columbus discovered America. When Tyndale was 14, Vasto da Gama sailed around the Cape of Good Hope to India, and the great era of world exploration had begun. It's a time of great change, an exciting time. Also a very, very, very difficult time for Bible believers. Just three years before Tyndale was born, the Spanish Inquisition was established. And by the time Tyndale was only 15 years old, a teenager, more, almost 9,000 had been burned to death. In Spain alone, 90,000 imprisoned under the Inquisitor General in Spain. And the Inquisition was raging. Persecutions were being poured out upon the Waldensians. Horrible, terrible, unspeakable persecutions that have been described in eyewitness reports in several books, including Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Waldensian Christians of Bohemia and Moravia. When Tyndale was only four years old, the Pope sent an army of 18,000 Catholics to make war against the Waldensians up in northern Italy. 
And that army, those armies came in and destroyed their villages and destroyed their towns and, and did unspeakable things to those people. Here's a couple of the old pictures drawn by eyewitnesses that are in old church history books. Cutting babies, splitting them in half as the mothers watch. Throwing them into the fires, many at a time. And those are just a couple of things that we can even mention that they did to those Bible-believing Christians when Wick Tyndale was just a young man and growing up. But the most important change of all that occurred in Wycliffe's time was the printing press. Of course, in Europe, the man named Gutenberg, John Gutenberg, had invented movable type in Europe, and had the printing press began to grow in prominence. And by the time that Tyndale was born, there were hundreds of printing presses out across Europe, and there were one or two even in England. England was behind the times in those days as far as printing. And so William Tyndale, his times, will take a short break and then continue with Tyndale's life just in a few minutes. All right, William Tyndale, we've considered his times. His early life is what we want to consider next. He was born about 1394. The exact date is not known by anyone, but somewhere around then. His family was very well-to-do and was involved, uh, for one thing, in the cloth business and importing cloth from Amsterdam and other places. He was born in Gloucestershire in northern Indi uh, England, toward Wales, up in the hills there. It's a place that had been long filled with Lollards and Waldensian teaching. And so uh, he grew up in a place that had a lot of, uh, of separatist type, type thinking against Rome. The Severn River ran through there, uh, right where uh, he lived, which is uh, where the ashes of John Wycliffe eventually flowed when they were thrown into the Swift River. So it was up in that same northern part of England. Now his education and his life's goal are very interesting. Tyndale uh, attended Magellan College in 1506 when he was about 12 years old. A uh, very young man. Magellan was one of the dozen colleges that made up Oxford University of that day. And so he was going to college. He uh, completed his B.A. in 1512 and his Master's in 1515. Now, in those days at Oxford, no theology was studied until after an MA had been completed. And so you weren't going to Oxford to learn the Bible or theology. And uh, Tyndale often wrote about his earlier days, or many times did, and uh, he always criticized that type of education. He said many years later, in the universities, they have ordained that no man shall look into the Scripture until he be nursed in heathen learning eight or nine years and armed with false principles with which he is clean shut out of the understanding of Scripture. Of course, that's what public schools do today in America and brainwash the uh, uh, minds of students. And so uh, Wycliffe uh, Tyndale was in that type of education. And then he went to Cambridge. At least John Fox said that he went to Cambridge after that. It's possible that at Cambridge he studied Greek uh, more thoroughly under Richard Crock, who had just come back from Europe, a very famous uh, Greek professor who lectured in Greek in Cambridge in 1518. But Tyndale was a brilliant student. He mastered seven languages that he knew as well as his mother tongue English, which were Latin, Greek, Hebrew, German, French, Spanish, and Italian. And he didn't know uh, 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 just a little bit of these languages. He, could, he was as fluent in them as his mother tongue, English. And in addition to that, he knew parts of other languages, such as Welsh. He was converted to Christ sometime either in his childhood or during his student years. We know that when he was a student at Oxford and at Cambridge, he conducted Bible studies, and he taught the Bible to other students. And so we know that he knew Christ at least by that point in his life. John Fox, who wrote the, the greatest hit, uh, biography of Tyndale, 
right after Tyndale had died, said that Tyndale was singularly addicted to the study of the Scriptures. He was singularly addicted to the study of the Scriptures. Now that single-minded purpose is what gave us such a great Bible. I don't think it can ever be done again today. We don't live in that time. We don't live in that time. He yearned to see the Scriptures translated into English directly from the original Hebrew and Greek so that it was available to the common man. Of course, the Greek New Testament had been printed, Erasmus Greek New Testament, in 1516, first printed. Now this is a copy that the school has of a later edition of Tyndale, the third edition. It was first printed in 1516, just a year after Tyndale completed his MA at Oxford. And so it was a time when the uh, Greek New Testament was there, and it was already being translated it, was, it had been translated into German by Martin Luther. And, and, and that was the time in which Tyndale was living. And it was his heart's desire that, that his people have that translated into the English language. When Tyndale left Cambridge in about 1521, he got a job as a tutor to the young children of Sir John Walsh of Little Sodbury Manor. Until a few years ago, this was open to the public. It's still much as it was during Tyndale's day. It's closed now. We're hoping to get permission to visit it in next March when we go back to England and Europe. But little Sodbury Manor and Tyndale was there, and the children were very young. And so Tyndale had a lot of free time. The Walshes were friends of Tyndale's brothers. His brothers, Edward and John, were influential men, wealthy men. And the Walshes, Sir John, that owned that estate had uh, been a high sheriff two times, was very well connected. He had been at the court. Sir John was close to old Henry VIII. And when Henry was crowned in 1509, Henry was there, or Sir John was there. And in fact, Henry VIII later, with his first wife Catherine, uh, uh, spent a night at Little Sodbury Manor later in Henry VIII's career. And so these were very influential people and and uh, Tyndale was there as a tutor to the children. We're told that he lived up in the attic. And uh, so he had a very quiet type place to himself, away from the business of that household. And we believe that it's here that he began the translation of the English Bible that we have today in that quiet attic room. And uh, Tyndale was not only translating, he was preaching. He preached out in the open air. He preached in marketplaces in that part of England. And uh, he saw more and more clearly the ignorance of his own people, the Bible ignorance, and that the only hope of his people was that somehow they have the Scriptures that they can understand in their own language. The people could not read Latin. Even the priests of those days were incredibly ignorant of the Bible. One test of priests was done in the early 1500s, right in Tyndale's time, testing priests about their Bible knowledge. uh, Thirty-four of them did not know the author of the Lord's Prayer. And so there was incredible Bible ignorance among the priests. They didn't care anything about the Bible. And their goal was not to learn the Bible. They had some things in English that Rome allowed to be distributed. And Rome makes a big deal about this today. Well, yes, the most popular of those was called the Mirror of the Life of Christ. It was uh, translated from Latin by a man into English, and Rome allowed that to be distributed among the people, the Mirror of the Life of Christ. And, and you would think, well, at least the people had some synopsis of Jesus' life then. no. That's not what the mirror of the life of Christ was about. It was about Mary. It exalted Mary. Jesus was there, but just kind of by way of passing to get to Mary. And it was full of fiction, just absolute fiction and nonsense. And so the people were in great darkness. 
Why? Because of Rome. That's why. Tyndale influenced the Welshers while he was there, the Welshers. And they became Protestants later. He uh, was, got himself into trouble first, right there. He was called before a tribunal of Catholic priests, and bishops. And he wrote about it later. This is what he said happened when he was called before that Catholic tribunal. When I came before the chancellor, he threatened me grievously and reviled me and rated me as though I had been a dog. Here was this very educated man, very educated, scholarly man. They rated him like a dog for what he was preaching. He debated Catholic priests who visited little Sodbury Manor. The Catholics would come. Uh, this was a very wealthy ha- household. They would have big, uh, the influential Catholic leaders come in to s- sup with them. And, and Tyndale was there at the table. And of course, he would always get in a debate with them. And one day he was talking with this priest. And he's saying, we, we need the Word of God. And the priest said, we're better without God's laws than the Pope's. He said, it's better to have the Pope's laws than God's laws. That's what that priest said. Tyndale said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth a plow shall know more of the Scriptures than thou dost. And he did. He made a Bible for the plow boy. And it was to the fulfillment of that noble purpose that he dedicated single-mindedly the rest of his life, suffering great privations, foregoing the joys of marriage and a settled family life, forsaking his own land and never seeing it again, his own, for the goal of giving his beloved people the Bible in their language, William Tyndale. What did William Tyndale believe? His doctrine. There's no evidence that he was ever a member of a Baptist church, and yet he had some very fine doctrine in the midst of that great darkness. He always translated the word ecclesia by the word congregation, which means that he understood that the church is a local, has a local aspect, is a, lo- is a local entity. He believed there were only two offices in the church, pastor and deacon. He uh, believed that elders should be married men, And so he denied the celibacy of Rome. And he believed in the priesthood of believers. In his first printing of of Matthew, which was never, uh, uh, never became a part of his Bible, the first Tyndale Bible had no, no notes. But when he first started printing that, as we'll see soon, uh, he had some notes in the margins as far as Matthew, which is as far as he got with that part of the printing. And the note at Matthew 16, 18 said this, Matthew 16, 18, where Rome gets its authority supposedly for the Pope, or Peter. This is what Tyndale said. Peter, in the Greek, signifieth a stone in English. This confession is the rock. The confession is the rock. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Now is Simon called Peter because of his confession. Whosoever then likewise confesseth Christ, the same is called Peter. Now is this confession come to all that are true Christians. Then is every Christian man and woman Peter. So he certainly degraded the Pope and believed in the priesthood of the believers. Everyone that confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is, has that confession and is the stone. And so baptism. It's very interesting that what he believed on baptism. He did not believe that baptism washes away sin. He believed that baptism is a plunging in water, which of course is immersion. He believed that baptism must be preceded by repentance and faith. And that totally destroys infant baptism. What baby can have repentance and faith? And so that is what he believed in some of his doctrines. Now let's consider his translation work. Tyndale first attempted to do his translation in England. And there's evidence that he started it up in Little Sodbury Manor. 
And, uh, but he left Gloucestershire in 1523, and he went down to London to the Bishop of London, Cuthbert Tunstall, to try to get permission to translate the Bible into their own language. Now, way back in 1408, the Constitutions of Oxford forbade the translation of the Scriptures into English, and I, it appears that he was hoping to find an authority that could override that and allow him to do it. Now, one of the reasons he went to Cuthbert Tunstall is that Tunstall had shown some evidence that perhaps he was more open to the translation of the Bible. Tunstall had helped Erasmus in the, in the publication of the Greek New Testament. Tunstall, the Bishop of London, had helped Erasmus. He had helped him gather readings. It said, falsely, so often, that Erasmus had hardly anything to work from. Just a meager handful of manuscripts, that's all he had. Well, that's silly. He had readings from manuscripts all over Europe. Right. And Tunstall was one of those that sent him readings from rare manuscripts from England. Of course, Erasmus had been in England and taught in England. And others sent him readings from the Vaticanus. And he had all kinds of uh, uh, manuscript evidence before him. But Tunstall had done that, and so uh, apparently Tyndale thought perhaps he would give me some help and, and, and help me here having that kind of authority, being the Bishop of London. But Tyndale quickly learned that that was not going to be the case. In fact, T Tunstall later burned Tyndale's Bibles. Later on, Tyndale wrote about his experiences in London. He said, A thousand books had they rather to be put forth against their abominable doings and doctrines than that the Scripture should come to light. He said, The thing they're most afraid of is the Bible. Right. For as long as they keep that down, they will so darken the right way with the mist of their sophistry and so tangle them that either rebuke or despise their abominations with arguments of philosophy and with worldly similitudes and apparent reasons of natural wisdom and with wresting the Scriptures unto their own purpose, clean contrary unto the process, order, and meaning of the text, and so delude them in discanning upon it with allegories, that though they feel in thine heart and art sure, though thou feel in thine heart and art sure, how that all, that is, all is false that they say, yet couldst thou not solve their subtle riddles. I don't know if you've ever dealt with Rome very closely. But she's very subtle. She's very clever. She's very tricky. Which thing only moved me to translate the New Testament. Because I had perceived by experience how that it was their mother, how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the Scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue that they might see the process, order, and meaning of the text. Or else, whatever truth is taught them, these enemies of all truth quench it again. That is, with apparent reasons of sophistry and traditions of their own making, and partly in juggling with the text, expounding it in such a sense as impossible to gather of the text itself. What a brilliant man he was, and how wise he was. A wealthy businessman in London took Tyndale under his wing. And Tyndale lived in his house for almost a year. And he spent his time there translating the Bible that perhaps he started up in Little Sudbury Manor. And Humphrey Monmouth, the, the businessman, the wealthy dealer in draperies and cloth, supported him at that time and loved him. In fact, he paid Tyndale's way to Europe when Tyndale went across the sea in April 1524. And here we have England and the straits there that separated from Europe and France. And he went across and he went into Germany. He went to Cologne at first. And so it was this businessman, Monmouth, that financed him and sent him on his way and helped him. Tyndale first went to Cologne, Germany. And his translation of the New Testament was ready for the printer by 1525. This is a later edition of Tyndale. 
And by 1525, it was, it was ready for the printer there at Cologne, and it was at the press. And it was in process of being printed. And the printing was stopped. There was a Catholic spy named Cochleus in Latin. And he learned by accident that this printing was going on. Now this was totally illegal. They were going to smuggle this back into England. They're going to call the revolution over there. Cochleus got word of that. He came to that very press and had some printing done of his own. And he, got, he heard the printers talking about this. And he took those printers out and he got them drunk. And he got them to tell him what was happening. And he found out the plan. And here, the Bible's going to be printed in English. And we're going to ship it across, smuggle it into England. We're going to have a revolution. He went to the authorities. And the authorities sent uh, uh, soldiers down and, and to uh, take Tyndale and to take those uh, scriptures and to stop the printing. Tyndale got word of it by God's grace. They had finished part of the book of Matthew at that point. He was able to get the copies that they had printed, the sheets there, unbound sheets, and get on a ship and go down the river, the Rhine River, to Worms, Germany. He was there in, uh, uh, toward the northern part of Germany in Cologne and down the river to Worms. And there he uh, completed that precious New Testament. It was small. Why was it small? Because they had to smuggle it. And they had to hide it. It was small. It was very precious. And they printed maybe 3,000 to 6,000, between three and 6,000 copies of that first edition. It had cross-references, but nothing else. We don't know what was in the title page. None have survived. There's only one entire copy and one part, partial copy that exists today of Tyndale's first printing of three to 6,000 copies, and neither one of those have a title page. It's believed that his name was not on it. The original prologue, which had been written and was printed at Cologne before the authorities came in, was never a part of the Tyndale Bible. Uh, it never later became a part. For some reason, he decided not to include the prologue when the thing was finally finished. But the prologue was printed separately and distributed in England as a doctrinal tract called the Pathway to Holy Scripture. Not only the Bible brought this powerful revolution and reformations and revivals, but the distribution of powerful literature did. Very important literature. And so he distributed that. That prologue, the original prologue, which never was printed with the Bible, had three parts. It explained, first of all, why the Bible should be translated into English as an apologetic against Rome. Secondly, it explained the law and the gospel. It preached the gospel and uh, faith and works and these important doctrinal matters that regard salvation. And the third part of that prologue uh, was a teaching on the sinful, condemned nature of man. It was a very powerful little booklet and tract that was distributed in its own right. Here's a couple quotes from that original prologue. Tyndall said, When the gospel is preached to us, He openeth our hearts and giveth us grace to believe and putteth the Spirit of Christ in us. And we know Him as our Father most merciful. The blood of Christ hath obtained all things for us of God, only the blood of Christ. He said, Yet are we full of the natural poison. Our nature is to do sin as the nature of a serpent to sting. He understood the nature of man, which America today does not understand. Almost immediately, copies of that small Bible began to be distributed and smuggled into England. It was smuggled clandestinely. It was, it was, it was brought in, in in many ways. They would hide sheets of it unbound under uh, uh, she, uh, cloth, bales of cloth. They would put, it, uh, uh, put copies of it in uh, 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 so that there were, no water could get into it, airtight, watertight containers, and put it down in barrels of wine and oil. 
Uh, uh, they would put it down inside of containers of grain and flour sacks. And they made chests with false sides and false bottoms and all kinds of clever ways. And from uh, uh, Europe, it went across the straits there and began to be smuggled out into England in those dark days. The Catholic authorities were quickly, quickly alerted to this problem, condemning his translation, saying that it's heretical. <laughs> It's just the Bible. How can the Bible be heresy? Well, it is to Rome. And ordered all copies confiscated and burned. Cardinal Wolsey demanded that a search be made house to house in London and Cambridge and Oxford. And those that were found to have copies were arrested. In February 1526, the first pile of scriptures was burned in England. Burning. The Word of God. As they did countless times throughout those dark ages. Burning the Word of God. Keeping it out of the hands of the people. But it didn't stop there. And by 1958, prisons were full in England of those believers that dared to try to own a copy of Tyndale's New Testament. One of those that was arrested was the old businessman, Humphrey Mummer. And he had, was charged on suspicion of heresy and thrown into the infamous London Tower. Why, he said this heresy. Faith alone is sufficient to save a man. <laughs> that terrible heresy. He was later released. But when he died in 1537, he left a large gift to support three gospel preachers. Another of those that were arrested soon after the printing of Tyndale's Bible was his brother John, who was in, in London on business as a cloth merchant. He was charged with distributing his brother's Bible. He was heavily fined, heavily fined, 18,000 pounds. And that day was fortune. He was forced to ride through the city on a horse sitting backwards with copies of the pages torn out, stuck to his garments. Thousands of copies of Tyndale's Bible were burned. So fierce were those persecutions, as we've already said, that only one entire copy of that first edition exists today. One copy, which is now owned by the British it used to be, of course, somewhere else. One copy and one partial copy. So fierce was Rome's hatred of that Bible. Well, it went beyond that, though. In February 1529, the first reformer was burned in England in Tyndale's day. Burned. Thomas Hitton was captured in Kent. It was an area that was full of heretics, old separatists. They always had problems with Kent. And he was captured there, he was arrested there for preaching and for the dastardly deed of having a copy of Tyndale's New Testament. He was burned at the stake. Burned at the stake. Burned alive at the stake. Many others followed him to the stake. Many others. Tyndale next settled in Antwerp in 1528. He started work on the Old Testament. By that time, he was as much a Hebrew scholar as he was a Greek scholar. A recent biography of Tyndale. There were not any biographies of Tyndale written for many, many decades. This is a recent one. And amazingly, David Daniel... Uh, it's a very good biography of Tyndale. It's a, he respects Tyndale greatly, which most scholars today do not. And there's a lot of discernment in that. I don't know who the man, that man is, but there's a lot of discernment in that book about Tyndale. And he admits, and he is a, a very much a scholar that wrote that, and that Tyndale's Hebrew was very masterly. And so he began the translation of the Old Testament and John Fox described Tyndale's days for us at that time. It's the only description we have. 
of what he did and who he was, or even what he looked like. First, he was a man very frugal, spare of body, a great student, an earnest laborer in the setting forth of the scriptures of God. He reserved or hallowed to himself two days in the week, which he called his pastime. Oh, what did he do? Let's do watch the Dodgers. Or what's a football team? He, he watched the Jets. Here's his pastime. This is why so much could be accomplished. Now listen. His pastime. Monday and Saturday. On Monday he visited all such poor men and women as were fled out of England because of persecution in Antwerp. And these, once well understanding their good exercises and qualities, he did very liberally comfort and relieve. And in like manner provided for the sick and diseased persons. That was Monday. That was his pastime. On Saturday, he walked around the town seeking every corner and hole where he suspected any poor person to dwell and where he found any to be well occupied and yet overburdened with children or else aged and weak, those he plentifully relieved. And thus he spent his two days of pastime, as he called them. And truly his alms were very large, the gifts that he gave. And so they, well, they might well be. For his exhibition that he had yearly of the English merchants of Antwerp when living there was considerable. And that for the most part he bestowed upon the poor. The rest of the days of the week he gave wholly to his book. His book. Wherein he most diligently travailed. When the Sunday came, then went he to read some one parcel of Scripture, the which proceeded so fruitfully, sweetful, sweetly and gently from him, much like the writing of John the Evangelist, that it was a heavenly comfort and joy to the audience. He preached and taught the Word of God on Sundays. Who gathered to hear him read the Scriptures. Likewise, after dinner, he spent an hour in the same manner. It was Tyndale's life. And so, he was at Antwerp. At one point, he was uh, back. Uh, he went down to Hamburg, Germany. And as he was sailing there on a ship, the ship was shipwrecked. And he lost all of his manuscripts and his books. And, but he arrived in Hamburg, started the translation over again. And uh, he lived in the house of a widow in Hamburg, for most of the year of 1529. And then he went back to Antwerp, where he was eventually captured and where he was put to death. Now Tyndale wrote many things other than the Bible, the New Testament translation. I wish we had time to look at some of those. They're so, uh, 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 to me, uh, edifying and stirring. He wrote the revelation of Antichrist. He was very bold against the Pope. He wrote the supplication of beggars. He wrote the parable of the unrighteous mammon in 1528, published it. It was an exposition that faith is the way of salvation without works. He wrote the obedience of a Christian man. He wrote how Christian rulers ought to govern. He wrote that to old Henry VIII, who needed that very badly. In 1530... He published The Practice of Prelates, whether, subtitled, whether the king's grace may be separated from his queen because she was his brother's wife. Well, old Henry got tired of his queen. And it did so happen that Catherine, his first wife, had been the wife of his brother, but his brother had died. So there was nothing wrong there in that marriage. But old Henry was tired of Catherine and he wanted to get married to Anne Boleyn, which is way off of our subject here. But that's why Tyndale wrote that particular little track. He boldly described the Pope in that track as an ivy that climbs up a tree until it saps gradually the strength of the tree and kills it. And the tree was England. The tree was the English nation. And uh, this particular tract shows us how well Tyndale understood Rome and Rome's trickery and scheming. In fact, the word practice there in that title, the practice of prelates, it's not practice as we use the word today. It means trickery and scheming. That's what it often meant in old times, 
practicing scheming. And it showed how Tyndale understood church history. This is what he said about church history. Even so, the bishop of Rome at the beginning crope along upon the earth, and every man trod upon him in this world. In other words, the bishop of Rome in the beginning didn't have much authority. But as soon as there came a Christian emperor named Constantine, he joined himself unto his feet and kissed them and crope up a little with begging. Now this privilege, now that, now this city, now that. St. Peter's patrimony, St. Peter's rent, St. Peter's land, St. Peter's right to cast a vain fear and superstitiousness into the hearts of men. This is how Rome began. And thus with flattering and feigning and vain superstition under the name of St. Peter, he crept up and fastened his roots in the heart of the emperor and with his sword climbed up above all his fellows and brought them under his feet. And as he subdued them with the emperor's sword, even so by subtlety and help of them, after that they were sworn faithful, he climbed up above the emperor and subdued him also and made him stoop unto his feet and kiss them. Yea, Celestinus crowned the emperor Henry V holding the crown between his feet. The old pope had the crown between his feet and put the crown on the emperor's head that way. That's how powerful the popes became as they crept up and crept up and took power. And as the pope played with the emperor, so did his branches and his members, the bishops, play in every kingdom, dukedom, and lordship. And thus the ivy tree hath under his roots throughout all Christendom, in every village, holes for foxes and nests for unclean birds in all his branches, and promiseth unto his disciples all the promotions of the world. Oh, how he understood Rome. No wonder the Pope hated him. And Henry didn't like him either. Henry VIII, that is. Henry VIII, King of England, as Tyndale was translating the Bible, Tyndale had reproved him for that marriage that he took, that second marriage to Anne Boleyn. But interestingly, Anne Boleyn did many things to help believers of that day. And as a result, got her own special copy of the Tyndale Bible, which is in the British Museum today. Anne Boleyn's Tyndale Bible. It's said by good authority that she kept it open in her room all the time and that she read it that she loved it. And so, Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, had a connection with Tyndale's Bible. Anne Boleyn. The beautiful Anne Boleyn that Henry divorced his first wife over. In her own copy of the Tyndale Bible. She assisted many believers. She did many things to help the believers, which no one else in that palace in that day was doing. And so Tyndale's time of imprisonment and death came, came very quickly. He was not able to finish the Old Testament. He, he had printed the first five books. And he had translated uh, its believed through Second Chronicles, as well as the book of Jonah. But in May 1535, he was arrested at Antwerp. He was staying in the British house, which was where merchants from Britain were staying. And he was there. And a man befriended him and lied to him. His name was Henry Phillips. He was a hireling, probably by one of the bishops back in England, to entrap Tyndale. This man came and he befriended Tyndale and Tyndale was deceived. And uh, one day this man came, Henry Phillips, and he came to Tyndale and he said, uh, he said, I forgot my money today. Can I borrow some money? He borrowed a sum of money. Old rascal. Why did he do that? Because he knew Tyndale was going to be arrested today. He never had to pay it back. So he borrowed that money. And Tyndale gave it to him. And then he said, Tyndale, why don't you come out and eat with me tonight? Let's go out to eat tonight. And Tyndale said, oh, oh, I'll pay for it. And he said, oh, no, I'll pay for it. <laughs> and uh, Tyndale was deceived. And there was a little narrow way that came out to the roadway, out from the um, merchant's house, the British merchant's house, and, and they posted two soldiers there by the road. And old 
Phillips was a tall man, apparently, and Tyndale was, was not very tall. And so uh, Phillips said, uh, uh, go in front of me there, Tyndale, through the little walkway. And, and, uh, and Tyndale said, oh, no, and you go in front of me, being a gracious man. He's, and Philip said, oh, I, I insist you go in front of me. And as he was walking out and almost to the road, Phillips, being much taller, pointed there so the soldiers would know that's him. And they arrested him. And they took him to a castle that was not too far away. And uh, only six miles north of Brussels, just 16 or so miles from uh, Amsterdam, an old castle of Billboard. It's not there anymore. And, uh, oh, by the way, old Phillips died a miserable death. He was charged later with treason against the king of England. He died destitute and friendless. But Tyndale was convicted of heresy. He was condemned to die under the laws of the Inquisition. He was imprisoned in a lonely, inhospitable prison cell for 16 months through one hard winter, cold. He was sick, didn't have proper clothing. He wrote a letter from the prison that was only discovered in the 1800s. It was in Latin and it was translated and this is what the only thing we have from Tyndale, from his own pen, from the prison. He said, I entreat your lordship and that by the Lord Jesus that if I am to remain here during the winter, you will request the procurator to be kind enough to send me from my goods, which he has in his possession, a warmer cap, for I suffer extremely from cold in the head, being afflicted with a perpetual cotta, which is considerably increased in this cell, a warmer coat also, for that which I have is very thin, also a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out, as also are my shirts. He has a woolen shirt of mine, if he would be kind enough to send it. I have also with him leggings of thicker cloth for putting on above and warmer caps for wearing at night. He said, I also ask permission to have a lamp in the evening, for it is wearisome to sit alone in the dark. And this is what he said, above all, I entreat and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the procurator that he procure that he may kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary, that I may spend my time with that study. And in return may you obtain your dearest wish, provided always that it be consistent with the salvation of your soul. But if before the end of winter a different decision be reached concerning me, I shall be patient, abiding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit, I pray, may ever direct your heart. And that's the only thing that we know that he actually wrote from prison. We do not know if he got his books. We do not know really what he did in prison as far as translation. It, during his imprisonment, it's said that Tyndale converted the jailkeeper, the keeper's daughter, and other members of the household. So, on the morning of October the 6th, 1536, Tyndale was burned at the stake. Why? Only one reason. He translated the Bible into English. Nobody with the United Bible Societies has ever suffered like that for the cause of the Word of God. At his death, Tyndale prayed. It is said by eyewitnesses, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. There's no evidence that old Henry was ever saved or converted. We do know, though, that his vicar general, Thomas Cromwell, authorized the printing of the Matthews Bible just months after the death of William Tyndale. Now, whose Bible was the Matthews Bible? The Matthews Bible. It was Tyndale's Bible. The Bible by Matthew. Now, Matthew was a pseudonym. It was a pen name. It was Roger, uh, John Rogers. 
John Rogers. But whose Bible was it? Well, it was Tyndale's, authorized for distribution in England, all of a sudden, right after Tyndale died. I wonder why. Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Answers to prayer. How many great events in history have been answers to secret prayers? Well, Tyndale had a mighty influence. His translation was the basis for several revisions, including the Coverdale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and eventually the King James Bible of 1611. A large percentage of Tyndale's words remain in our King James Bible. Nine-tenths in some places is still Tyndale. Five-sixths in other places is still Tyndale. And so every person that has ever been blessed through an English Bible, through the King James, and really on, in a more perverted sense, corrupt sense, has been blessed because of William Tyndale. And that's why we say he's the greatest name in the history of the English Bible and, and at least one of the greatest names in the history of the English people. And what a history. He gave the English people a Bible that is not only accurate, but it is beautiful. Amen. Genesis twenty two twelve, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. The words of William Tyndale. He not only did that, but he standardized the English language and has had a greater influence than Shakespeare on the English language itself, which finally some are recognizing, such as David Daniel. And so he had a very powerful influence in every possible way. William Tyndale. Now let's take one more short break. And then we'll conclude with the King James Bible. And so we have dealt with two of the great Bibles under the history of the English Bible, the Wycliffe and the Tyndale. We have one remaining, and that is the King James Bible of 1611. There were several revisions of the Tyndale that uh, lie between, lay between the Tyndale and the 1611, which we will mention in passing. The first was the Coverdale Bible of 1535, uh, printed in Antwerp and brought into England in 1536, the Coverdale Bible. Now here is a copy of the Coverdale of 1549 from the collection here at the college, at the university. Coverdale Bible, and you can see it's quite large. And then there was, and that was by Miles Coverdale. Picture of him, Miles Coverdale. He wasn't very good looking. <laughs> but he was a Bible translator. He was converted through the reading of the Scriptures and left the Catholic priesthood, fell in love with the Word of God. Later he wrote, Whatever the Scripture is known... Wherever the Scripture is known, it reformeth all things. And why? Because it is given by inspiration of God. And uh, there were different times he had to flee England, go to Europe, and then he would come back as times of persecution would ebb and flow. But his was the first uh, uh, complete English Bible, but of course it was mostly Tyndale's. And then the Matthew's Bible. The Matthew's Bible was printed in also in Antwerp and brought into England. And John Rogers was the editor or translator of this, Matthew's Bible. Thomas Matthew was a pen name that he had assumed because of the persecution, I suppose, of those days. The Matthew's Bible was intended for very serious study. And uh, it contained a collection of biblical passages that exhorted the reader to study the Scriptures. It had a summary of Bible doctrine that had been taken from a French Bible. 
and it had a concordance on Bible subjects that was also taken from a French Bible. So it was a study Bible, the Matthews Bible. Old John Rogers. John Rogers knew William Tyndale, was a friend of William Tyndale. And John Rogers followed Tyndale into the flames, gave his life for the testimony that he had for Christ. Old John Rogers had a large family, had 11 children, and uh, one was a little nursing baby at the time of his death. When they came and arrested him, he had to say goodbye to his wife, and that's the last time that he saw her until he was walking to the stake on that last day. And she was there with those children, holding that little nursing baby, watching her husband go to the flames. He asked for permission to have his family visit him, but the authorities were too cruel for that and denied it. So he said goodbye to his wife as he was walking to the stake. John Rogers, Matthew's Bible. And then we have the Great Bible. It's called because it was big. It wasn't a pocket Bible. You had to have a wheelbarrow to carry this Bible around. Our servant. And it was printed in England. And Published in 1539, it was a revision of the Matthews Bible. And copies of that were placed in all the churches of England then. In 1543, the fickle Henry VIII, again, after a time of quiet, when he had allowed the distribution of some of those Bibles, again demanded the destruction of all the translations bearing the name of Tyndale, and again forbade the common people to read the Bible in English in private or in public. They had been enjoying that for a few years, even under Henry. Here is a picture of a man standing with the Bible there, a great Bible, it looks like, in one of the churches, and the candles are there, it's at night, and people are sitting around, and he's reading the Bible to them. It's the first time they've ever heard it. And they were amazed at what it said. But Henry forbade that to happen again. And then the Geneva Bible was translated and by those that fled the persecution. And particularly they had fled persecution after Henry and after his son Edward, short reign, a Catholic Queen Mary came to the throne. And many had to flee and many went to Geneva and there is where the Geneva Bible was finished. The New Testament was finished during Mary's reign. And the Geneva Bible, it was a very, very influential Bible. The entire Bible was, was printed in 1560. The Geneva Bibles were ordinarily printed in small sizes, convenient for missionary use. That's what the small Bibles were for. The Waldenses had small Bibles before this. And uh, the, first entire, the first Bible... English Bible to contain verse divisions throughout was the Geneva Bible. Before that, the English Bibles were divided into chapters and paragraphs, but that was the first one divided into verses throughout. The Geneva Bible quickly became the prominent English Bible, and it was very, very powerful in its influence for almost a hundred years until the King James Bible superseded it. The Geneva Bible was the Bible carried to America by the first settlers from England. And it continued to be printed in England until 1617. And continued to be printed in Europe until much later than that, even after the King James Bible. And then there was the Bishop's Bible. The Bishop's Bible, so-called because it was produced by bishops in the Church of England. Bishops. But still, primarily it was the old Tyndale Bible, the Bishop's Bible. Never was very popular. People loved the Geneva Bible. And, and uh, the, for example, between 1568 and 1611, there were only 20 editions of the Bishop's Bible printed, but there were 120 editions of the Geneva 
And so you can see what the people loved and what Bible that they went to. The Bishop's Bible. And we come now to the King James Bible, which all of these other Bibles preceded. The most famous Bible of the Reformation in England was the King James Bible, also called the English Authorized Bible. Gets its name from King James I of England, who authorized its translation. King James, all do it out there. A new edition of the English Bible was proposed at a conference which was held at Hampton Court, Hampton Palace, which is down the river away from London. And the kings used to take uh, their own special royal barge down the river and they would go there. Very interesting place. I've toured that. Anne Boleyn was there. All of his wives were there a little bit. <laughs> and uh, they had a conference there in 1604. And the Puritans, who were trying to reform the Church of England, presented a petition called the Millennium Petition, calling for reformation of the Church of England. And the leader of that group, John Reynolds, proposed that new translation, and the king agreed. He thought it was a good idea. And within six months, a list of 54 scholars was drawn up. And uh, it worked out that only 47 to 50 actually did the work. There some died whatever, but 47 to 50 men actually did the translation on the King James Bible. And so, the Bible, the group, the translation started in 1607. The group was divided into six companies. It's very important to understand how the King James Bible was translated. This is our heritage. This is our Bible. It's unique. In the whole history of Bible translation, it's unique. The group was divided into six companies. And each company was assigned a portion of the Scripture to translate. Six companies. Like part of the prophets, the historical books, and divided up. And the first thing that happened was that each member of that company would each member take that portion of Scripture to which he was assigned and translate that, each member of the company, separately. This was rule number eight of these rules that were drawn up for the King James Bible, which said, every particular man of each company to take the same chapter or chapters and having translated or amended them severally by himself where he thinks good. So each one did his own private work, then the company as a whole met together. This was also rule number eight, which said, All to meet together to confer what they have done and agree for their part what shall stand. And so, rule number eight was that they privately translated and then met together and made, agreed on one translation of that portion of the book. When a company completed its portion, that portion was then sent to all five other companies that they would review so that each part of the translation went through the hands of every company, six companies. And in that manner, they did the work. Now that's rule number nine, which said, As any one company hath dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judicially. And so, each book of the translation was reviewed by all of the companies. Not only that, but if there was some particularly difficult word or passage, they were instructed to uh, get help from anyone in the kingdom. Who would, uh, anyone that would have w wisdom and skill to give them assistance. Now, when the books were received by the companies, it, it appears that their method was that one of the members of the company, there were seven or so members, would read that translation aloud, verse by verse, and the other members of the company would sit there with a translation 
a respected translation or a Greek and Hebrew text, whatever was necessary, comparing that reading to what he had before him so that it was just thoroughly, constantly sifted. Do you see what happened? There's never, this has never happened before or since. And uh, not only that, but learned men, anyone in the kingdom that had some idea about the translation and, and could send his ideas and, and to the committee, and they were to consider those. And so it was a very thorough work. The finished product from each company was then submitted to a 12-man committee who was composed of the two chief men from each company. And they then determined the final translation and prepared it for the press. And so, as the number of the companies was six, and the number of each, in each company varied from seven to ten men in a company, it, it follows that each part of that translation was examined at least 14 different times as it went through that, that, that process. Many times, 15 and, and even 17 times. The basic translation took two years, and then nine months were required for the revision and the final preparation for the press. Two years, nine months. That was considered the printing of the King James Bible. It was first printed in 1611. It was printed by Robert Barker, a very large volume. On its title page, it said, The Holy Bible, containing the Old Testament and New, newly translated out of the original tongues, and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special commandment. And down all the way till 1709, the Barker family held the sole right and their consigns to print the English Bible, uh, the King James Bible in England, Barker family. Now the translators of the King James Bible. The translators of our Old English Bible were scholars of the highest caliber. Alexander McClure, who published a biography of those translators back in 1855, said this about them, 1855, It is confidently expected that the reader of these pages will yield to the conviction that all of the colleges of Great Britain and America, even in this proud day of boastings, could not bring together the same number of divines equally qualified by learning and piety for the great undertaking. And not today either. In fact, especially not today. Everyone whose wits are filled with worldly things. Especially not today. It's not going to be done again. Almost all of those translators were masters of Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Masters. We're not talking about the little dabbling we do today. We're talking about masters. That was just a basic part of what was called a classical education of that day. Why, you grew up with Latin. You spoke Latin as well as you did English. You spoke Greek as well as you did English. You spoke Hebrew as well as you did English. Show me somebody today that's five years old and can read the Hebrew Bible like one of these translators of the King James Bible did. Five years old. Masters. Scholars today, ordinarily, do not even start learning those languages until their mature adult years. These men grew up with it as babes. There's a difference. At Oxford and Cambridge in those days, in the 1500s and 1600s, all of the printed texts were in Latin. Nothing was in English. You didn't speak in English. All of the compositions, all of the lectures, all the disputations were in Latin. Erasmus, when he taught at Cambridge in the early 1500s, Erasmus did not speak a word of English. Erasmus didn't speak English. How did he speak? Latin and Greek. All the students understood him perfectly well. You show me a Bible college today in America where that's true. It's not. 
They didn't only know those languages such as Hebrew and Latin and Greek. They knew many of them, all the cognitic languages, associated languages, Aramaic and uh, Persian and Coptic and Syriac and Chaldee and the other languages that you need to know to dig into the history and, and uh, uh, genealogy of the Bible. By the way, in 1605, of the 6,000 volumes in the Oxford University, guess how many were in English? 60. They weren't dealing in English. They are dealing in Latin and Hebrew and Greek. And we're talking about a different time. Different caliber of scholarship. And they had the Ability not only to read the modern editions of those languages. It's one thing to read modern Greek. It's a whole other thing to read ancient Greek manuscripts. And so, their scholarship was of the highest caliber. Consider some examples. Lancelot Andrews had mastered 15 languages. Mastered 15 languages. Miles Smith. Miles Smith was expert in... Hebrew, Chaldee, Syriac, Latin, Greek, and Arabic. They were as familiar to him as his mother tongue. Henry Seville, a very weighty Greek scholar, very famous. Henry Seville, the first to edit the complete works of Chrysostom. John Boyce. He's the one that could read the whole Bible in Hebrew at age five. William Bedwell, one of the best Arabic scholars of his time. Edward Lively, one of the most eminent scholars of Hebrew alive of that day. John Reynolds, the famous Puritan, who asked the king to do the translation, was on the committee. It was said that his memory and learning were near a miracle. All Europe at that time could not have produced three men superior to Reynolds, Jewel, and Usher. All of Europe. And that was a great day of scholarship. Richard Brett was, his, was an eminent linguist in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldee, Aramaic, Ethiopic. These are just some examples of the scholarship of those men. But they weren't only scholars. They were humble men. They knew that only God could give the wisdom to translate the Bible. All the scholarship in the world will never give a man the ability to accurately translate the Bible because it's a spiritual book. Yeah, that's right. They knew that. To that purpose, this is what they wrote in their preface, the original translator's preface. To that purpose, there were many chosen to translate that were greater in other men's eyes than in their own and that sought the truth rather than their own praise. In what sort did these assemble? In the trust of their own language, or of their sharpness of wit, or deepness of knowledge, judgment, as it were an arm of flesh, at no hand. They trusted in him that hath the key of David, opening and no man shutting. They prayed to the Lord, the Father of our Lord, to the effect that St. Augustine did, O oh, let thy scriptures be my pure delight, let me not be deceived in them. Neither let me deceive by them. In this confidence and with this devotion did they assemble together. Not too many, lest one should trouble another. And yet many, lest many things might escape them. Not too many, not too few. Very wise translation work. Everything about it was done with great wisdom. I wonder where that wisdom came from. King James? No. It didn't even come from those men themselves. It was from a higher power. You would have to be blind not to see that. To read the King James Bible and not see the hand of God, you would have to be blind. They weren't paid for their work, by the way. So they weren't doing it for money. Only 12 received any money, and that was the 12 that oversaw the final revision. And they only received a weekly allowance for basic expenses because they had to live in London during those nine months. 
They weren't paid for their work. What about King James then? What did he do? What did he have to do with the translation? Almost nothing. He didn't choose the translators. He didn't do any of the translation. The stingy guy didn't even fund the work. And apparently he did not even initial an official authorization when it was completed. If he did, it doesn't exist. No one's been able to ever find it. What did he have to do with it? Almost nothing, but it bears his name. Now let's consider the nature of this translation, the King James Bible. It is a masterpiece of Bible translation. A masterpiece of Bible translation, the King James Bible. It wonderfully conforms to the Hebrew and Greek. It has been called the miracle of English prose. The miracle of English prose. I have about 30 books in my library that exalt the King James Bible's language, just the language. When Harvard University Press published their literary guide to the Bible in 1987, what Bible did they choose to represent the literary qualities of the Bible, the King James Bible? And... Uh, this is what, why they said they did that. They chose the King James Bible. Our reasons for doing so must be obvious. It is the version most English readers associate with the literary qualities of the Bible. It is still arguably the version that best preserves the literary effects of the original languages. 1987, NIV was there then. That's what Harvard University Press said then. Well, those these and thous, that old language there, what about all that? Shouldn't we take that out? No, we shouldn't take the these and thous out. Thee, thou, thy, and thine are in the King James Bible for a reason, for accuracy. To help us to understand where the Greek and Hebrew uses the plural in the second person pronoun. And the Hebrew and Greek make a distinction there, but English in modern days does not. You go over there and get me a Coke. Or you go over there and get me a Coke. Be a lot of Cokes. But that's the same thing in English. You, you. You singular, you plural. Modern English makes no distinction, but we'd have that in the King James Bible. One example, look at John 3. Or listen as I read this. Very, very famous passage, the ye must be born again passage, thee and thou, thine and, thy and thine, you and yours. In John 3, 7, Jesus said, in John 3, 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Well, there we have the Greek. See, if you don't know Greek, it's all right, because thee is singular and you the T's are always singular. The Y's and that, that pronoun are always plural. The ye and your and yours, there's always plural. Thee, thy, thou, and thine are always singular. And there you have it. But why? Because of accuracy. Because that's the only way we English people have to know today in modern times that distinction between the singular and plural. And that's pretty important. Ye, thou. Marvel not as said unto thee, Nicodemus, you yourself, Nicodemus, ye, all of you, must be born again. And Nicodemus understood that very well. Oh, he's talking to me. Oh, he's talking to all of us. But if you don't have a King James Bible and have the these and the thy and thou and thine, you don't know that. And so look for that as you read because that's a matter of accuracy. The King James Bible quickly gained ascendancy over the Geneva Bible. Quickly. Now, some histories have misstated this. But between 1611 and 1614, at least 17 editions of the KJV were published, but only six of the Geneva, for, at first three years after. And between 1611 and 1644, there were 182 editions of the KJV, but only 15 of the Geneva. And that Geneva quickly was replaced by the King James Bible. Why? The people loved it. That's the only reason. Nobody was advertising it. In any kind of modern sense, it simply 
People liked it. And it replaced the King James Bible very quickly. In fact, by 1618, the Geneva was no longer printed in England. And by 1640, it was no longer imported even from Holland because nobody wanted to buy it. Now, the King James Bible underwent some minor revisions between 1629 and 1769. Some minor revisions. And uh, 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 those revisions were associated with those presses, Cambridge. And uh, it is often said, of course, by those that want to degrade the King James Bible and want to give people the impression that their King James Bible is not the same as it used to be, that there are 40,000, 50,000 changes been made. Yeah, there have. But tell me this, what is the difference between S-I-N-N-E and S-I-N? Not anything. What's the difference between B-O-R-N-E and B-O-R-N? Nothing. What's the difference between B-L-I-N-D-E and B-L-I-N-D? Nothing. Blind, blind. Sin, sin. Born, born. That was the vast, overwhelming part of those changes were simply that kind of thing. Well then, how different really is the KJV of today than 1611? Well, Dr. Donald Waite did an extensive research on that one year. Set himself the task of taking the... Uh, 1611 KJV and comparing it to a modern Oxford edition of the KJV word by word and he found that there were 136 changes only 136 most of those very very minor out of 791,328 words well it hasn't changed think about that four centuries four centuries King James Version is still revered by millions of English-speaking people today. In 1995, I wrote to Thomas Nelson, publishers, to find out what English version has the greatest sales. Now remember, 1995, seven years ago. This is what they wrote to me. This is what um, uh, Philip Stoner, Vice President, Biblical and Religious Reference Publishing, Thomas Nelson, wrote to me on April 4, 1995. He said, all general distributors sell more KJV than NIV. Now, that was seven years ago. That's from the horse's mouth. He said, unfortunately, there is no industry-wide report available. He explained to me why some have stated that the NIV outsells it back then. He said, that perspective is based on data reported by Spring Arbor distributors, which footnotes in their report that their figures are based only on their distri distribution. And so that was only seven years ago that KJV was still outselling the NIV in America with no advertising. No advertising. Who is advertising the KJV? You go into the average bookstore, you have to dig around to find one. Still outselling. That's amazing. 400 years. In spite of the campaign that's been waged for 100 years to try to get people to read the modern versions. Well, let's think in conclusion about Tyndale's influence still today upon the KJV. Much of the powerful and direct and energetic language that we have in our old English Bible just comes to us directly from old Tyndale, who was running around hiding all the time, trying to get this work done, hiding from Rome. And so, even though it's been revised... Most of it is still the Tyndale Bible. Nine-tenths of 1 John in our King James Bible is Tyndale. Five-sixths of the book of Ephesians is directly out of Tyndale. And those proportions are maintained throughout those parts that Tyndale completed. The Tyndale Bible has affected the whole world. The Tyndale Bible reformed England and created out of it a great missionary sending nation. The light's gone out now. But the Tyndale Bible did that, and the Word of God went to the ends of the earth under that old British flag. In the 16th century, John Fox, 
who was observing and documenting the persecutions of that era. This is what he said was going on because of the Tyndale Bible. Everyone that could bought the book or busily read it or got others to read it to them if they could not themselves. And divers more elderly people learned to read on purpose. Old people, never been able to read. Why read? There's nothing to read worth reading. But now there's this Bible, I've got to learn how to read. An old person, learning how to read. Why they wanted to read that Bible. And even little boys flocked among the rest to hear portions of the Holy Scripture read. And it transformed that nation. And it created the United States of America. A nation that in former days was a spiritual light to the entire world. And what created this nation? This book. This book, period, made America great. And America was created as a bastion of religious liberty by those who believed this book and escaped persecution to establish a land of freedom where the Word of God could be preached. It motivated the founders to seek religious liberty. It inspired America's Political documents, what did this book did? And our judges and our court systems originally. And it built the hundreds of thousands of churches that once upon a time made this a great land. What did this did? Amen. They were built upon nothing else. Amen. Well, look with me at Philippians 2, 5-13 through 13, as we close this morning. Philippians 2, 5 through 13. I'm going to read to you out of Tyndale. You look at the King James Bible. And you can see we still have a lot of Tyndale. Philippians 2, 5 through 13. I'm going to read out of the Tyndale Bible. You look in the King James. Philippians 2, 5 through 13. There's a beautiful passage about Christ. Let the same mind be in you, the which was in Christ Jesus, which being in the shape of God, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, nevertheless he made himself of no reputation, and took on him the shape of a servant, and became like unto men, and was found in his apparel as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath exalted him, and given him a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee bow, both of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that all tongues should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, under the praise of God the Father. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not when I was present only, but now much more in mine absence, even so perform your own health with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both the will and also the deed, even of goodwill. Yeah, there's changes. But it's mostly old Tyndale. It's mostly old Tyndale. In fact, one of the miracles of history is that this esteemed committee of 47 to 50 great scholars didn't change very much. That is one of the miracles of history, if you know anything about scholars. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for this book. And Lord, we pray that we, Lord, would take a stand for it today. And Lord, not be cowed by the attacks upon it. And Lord, not be ashamed of it. There's nothing like it. And we thank you that you've given it to us. In Jesus' name.